Israel's military now in what it calls the heart of Gaza City. They said today it destroyed more tunnels used by Hamas. According to the IDF, these tunnels were located near a school sponsored by the UN. The IDF also announced today it had destroyed at least 130 tunnel shafts since the start of the war. Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu said earlier this week that Israel would maintain security over the Gaza Strip for, quote, an indefinite period. But Jeremy Diamond has more, including new footage of what that urban combat looks like. An Israeli armored vehicle advances through the Al Shati refugee camp. But an ambush awaits. Moments earlier, the same video shows a Hamas fighter armed with a rocket propelled grenade, moving slowly from behind the rubble. These are Hamas propaganda videos from the perspective of its fighters, showing Hamas militants peering around buildings and through the rubble before striking armored vehicles. CNN has geolocated several videos released in recent days to northern Gaza, in Beit Hanun, Atatra, and the Shati refugee camp, indicating Hamas is likely still mounting attacks in areas Israeli forces entered over a week ago. The videos provide a limited window into the group's guerrilla tactics and the threats Israeli forces face as they move deeper into Gaza. As we're moving in, we're fighting more and more close combat, urban combat type engagement. The Israeli military says its forces have encircled and are now operating in the heart of Gaza City, where they face the dangers of dense urban combat and a vast network of tunnels Hamas fighters are using to sneak up on Israeli forces. The nature of urban warfare is that, you know, they go down a tunnel and come up somewhere else. And that is exactly why we're moving slowly. We're not advancing, we're not rushing into this, we're taking sp strategic positions. Israeli forces say they've destroyed 130 Hamas tunnel shafts like this one since launching their ground offensive. We're just scratching the surface of that. But many more still remain. Jeremy Diamond joins us now. What's the latest on evacuation options for civilians in Gaza? Well, Anderson, in recent days, tens of thousands of Palestinian civilians have used those evacuation corridors established by the Israeli military over the last several days to flee south. In fact, just today, according to the United Nations, 50,000 people took advantage of a five-hour window to evacuate south using Salah al-Din Road, one of the main arteries going north-south in the Gaza Strip. And all of this, Anderson, comes not only as the Israeli military is ramping up its military operations in northern Gaza, but also, of course, as the humanitarian situation there has grown worse. Access to clean water is extremely limited. Hospitals are running out of medical supplies, running out of fuel to carry out even basic operational uh, matters. And Israeli officials are, of course, ramping up their ground offensive in northern Gaza. Uh, Israeli officials now saying that Israeli troops are operating in the heart of Gaza City, pressing forward with this advance as the Israeli prime minister vows no ceasefire unless hostages are released. Anderson. Jeremy Diamond, thanks so much. Many Palestinian Americans who made it out of Gaza are just now getting home, facing a very particular heartache. They're relieved, obviously, to be safe, but worried every moment about their friends and family who are not. My next guests are Americans who, along with their almost two-year-old son, were in Gaza on October 7th visiting family. They just got back to their home in Massachusetts earlier this week. Uh, Aboud uh, Okal and Wafa Abu Zaida join us now. Welcome home, first of all. H how do you feel? Are you, mis are you exhausted? We feel, I had a mixed feeling, to be honest. I feel happy because we're safe here. Yeah. We're back, but our um, thinking, um, minds um, in Gaza, because I still have my parents over there, Abu's parents um, still over there. We text them every um, every minute to make sure they are okay. Um, we made it here just because of Yusuf. Mm -hmm. I want to make sure he's he's okay. He's safe. Yusuf is your your baby. Yusuf is my baby. He's he's gonna turn um, two years next next month. You've got home in time for his birthday. Yeah. Yeah. What was you? You had gone there both to visit family. Yeah. And you'd spent a couple weeks there. Obviously, you had no idea this all was about to, to, to happen. When did you realize, I mean, was it on the morning of October 7th that you realized something has happened? 
exactly. Yeah. yeah. I think that October 7th, we it was 6 ish o'clock in the morning local time. And I think I remember hearing <clears throat> uh, sounds of rockets launching. And uh, I woke up Wafa and I said, I think that is uh, uh, the sound of rockets. And, and we checked out the windows, and, and it, indeed it was. And then a few minutes later, we were trying to look at news. And, mm. and then it was unclear at the beginning, but then in, in, in a couple of hours as news rolled out of, of what was happening that day, we realized that we are, we are in trouble um, and that uh, this, is, this, is a, this is going to be a big event. What was that going south? Was it difficult? I and mean, once you actually got together and, and headed down there? It was chaotic. I think uh, early that day when we heard the announcement by the IDF to head south, there was no timeline given. There were no specific instructions other than just go pass just go. south of, of Wadi Gaza, which is basically Gaza Valley, a landmark. Um, so everyone scrambled. At this point, I mean, did you think the border might still be open? Because, I mean, there was so much misinformation, so much, I mean, people didn't know what was going on, but that Rafa border has been shut this whole time. So yeah. did you think you could get out at that point or just thought, get south and oh, we'll yeah. figure it out? Yeah, we tried a couple of times going to a Rafah border, mm -hmm. but every time we wait for a couple of hours and the gate, um, it's not opening, mm -hmm. so leave. And you were, in a, you were in a house staying with dozens of other people? Yeah, 40 people. 40 people. 40 people, yeah. We used to share everything with 40 people. And getting supplies and things, how, what was that like? It, it was so difficult. It was I mean, so difficult. You had a, a two, your baby needs milk. Oh, yeah. Even that is... Even that, yeah. We, we used to wake up every morning uh, thinking about, like, how we're going to get water, bread, food. Abud used to go with his brother waiting on the line, mm. getting water and, um, and bread and come back um, after seven, six hours um, with one gallon of water for 40 people. Mm. And then like uh, pieces of a bread, uh, it's not enough for 40 people. Mm -hmm. So we used to share with. What, with a child, I mean, I, I think about it, I mean, obviously all those kids, um, was, your, was, he, was, he, was he scared? I mean, was, what was his sense of what was going on? I told myself I have to be um, relaxed mm -hmm. when, I, when I hear all the sounds, so, I started to teach him, okay, this is um, what you hear, this is a fireworks. Remember the 4th of July? It's the same thing. Um, I don't know if, I don't think he trusted me. Mm. That I don't think he believed that this is a fireworks. Mm. And at some point the milk ran out. At some what? point the milk did run out, yeah. Yeah, the <clears> milk <throat> ran out in the beginning because I knew it's, we're gonna run out at some point. So I started to reduce his, um, his bottle, like from um, whole bottle to half bottle giving him. Right. So the last five days or a week, so we ran uh, completely out of uh, milk. I used to give him water instead of milk. It's gotta be this strange feeling of being relieved that you're out and yet your family's there. We, we still processing what we experienced. I, I can't believe, I can't believe our short trip just turned to a nightmare. And even though we're physically out, I think mentally we're still there. I think at some points, um, it cannot be worse to be on the outside. Nothing is worse than being inside of Gaza right now. Uh, whether if, if you're not dying from, from airstrikes or shelling, you're, put, you're, you're at high risk of dying because of dehydration and, and lack of food. And, and despite that little aid that's coming in, it's, it's not really making, it's not moving the needle. Um, well, thank you so much. I'm so glad you're, you're, you're back. And I'm, but I understand that, that tug and that feel of family left behind. So I'm, I'm, I'm sorry that, that you have that. Thanks for having us. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Anderson.